I'm here with the man, the myth, the legend. You guys have requested him. You are one of the most requested ones besides, you know, it's been you and Pooch and Toba, to, to, what, uh, Toby. Toby, uh, Big Mick um, has been one of the, so thank you so much for having me. My here. pleasure. I truly pleasure. appreciate it. We have a Great ton of knobs, a ton of outboard, um, but today's a little bit different. We are at the steel mill. Uh, and why are we here? Well, we actually just moved here. We, <clears throat> it's our second day. Uh, we've been rehearsing for the month in uh, Soundcheck. So I had all of this sound set up in Soundcheck in an isolated room. Band was in another room, just working on arrangements, working on songs, trying to build the set, yeah. so to speak. And then we plow over into here and I come in with some PA system. The, the lighting guys and the video guys that you can see have been working here for weeks, you know, prepping the show. Every night that I would get done at Soundcheck, we'd upload all the mixes. These guys would download them, start working on programming on shows, or for the show, et cetera. And then we loaded in yesterday, and I mean, one o'clock, downbeat, here we go, and ran the set. You know, I mean, it was pretty cool. You know, I mean, the whole production's working when you yeah. show up, so. Could you talk a little bit, especially for the newer people, um, there's a progression that goes to your first tour. Not your first tour, I'm sorry, your first show. Yeah. I think some people think that like that is when you guys are first there, but there's a whole back end to this of pre-production uh, that leads up to that first show. Yeah, Could you it, explain how that works? I mean, works? it changes a little bit act to act. Sure. Uh, but somebody like Kenny, I mean, who's been doing this scale of shows for a long, long time. I mean, he's been headlining stadiums now for, you know, close to 20 years. So, you know, it's a pretty organized structure for him where you know, the, the band members will kind of collectively meet offline and they'll talk about things that they might want to do in songs. And then we get to that month in uh, kind of band rehearsals, you know, and that is strictly just about getting song arrangements, getting everybody familiar, getting everybody to play into shape a little bit, you know, because I mean, it's, you don't just kind of show up and do a two hour show of this kind of energy. I sure, mean, yeah. you know, you just shred you physically. Yeah. So. You know, everybody's kind of singing into shape, playing into shape a little bit. So that happens in that first 30 days. And then when we get here for another two weeks, we'll just be cycling the show with every iteration of sound check, or I mean sound list, I mean set list <laughs> that we can come up with, figuring out what songs we want, how it's gonna flow, transitions, everything. And you're kind of just trying to make all your best guesses on what it might be night to night. Oh, if we're gonna be in a shed, we'll do this. If we're gonna be in the stadium, we'll do this, you know. I mean, all of that kind of thinking. And then we'll load, load out of here and go to the first show in Tampa, and we'll be there for about a week running it at full scale, you know, really kind of ironing out all the bugs. And trust me, that all is a luxury to have that kind of time, you know, so. Uh, the run up for me previous to getting here is I'm at home. I, I have a console at home. I obviously have all the recordings at home. And usually when we're about two months out, I'll start going into the studio at night maybe two nights a week, three nights a week, and just run the show once, you know, just try to get familiar with the moves, all the changes, et cetera, just to kind of get myself, my head back in it, my ears back in it. Uh, and then we, I load the show file, load the Pro Tools up and head to Nashville, you know, that's how we do it, so. I think there's, uh, people see you here and think that you've been here for a long time and forget there's a long on-ramp to getting to where you're at nowadays. Truly, um, yeah. If you don't mind, I would love to um, hear a little bit, I'm sure you've told the story many times, but what got you into sound in the first place? Is this something you always were very passionate about? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, there's so many things that run through my head when people ask me, how did you get interested in sound? Yeah. Or how did you get to sound? But, you know, I was always driven by it for some reason when I was a kid, like I, I can remember I mean, I'm, I'm old, but I'm not this old. <laughs> I remember, you know, as a very, very young boy, the teenage son of the woman who was babysitting me was all about the Beatles. I mean, that was just, when he would come home from school, it would be Beatles for three, four, five hours. So, you know, there's an imprint that's being done there. I mean, no question about it. And then as I got to be a little bit older, as I got to be, you know, eight, 10 years old, I mean, I wanted to be a musician. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted to be Mitch Mitchell in the Jimi Hendrix experience. That's what I wanted to be. <laughs> So, you know, I started out as a musician, which gets you to think and hear things sure. differently, of course. What was your instrument? Drums. Okay. Drums. So, at some point, you know, even as the little band that we were forming as pre-teens and teens, you know, you start to understand, well, wait a minute, we've got to have speakers for the vocal to be able to hear and everything. And you have this very kind of elementary idea of what is actually taking place at a show, you know. 
So by the time I got to be about 13, 14 years old, I was starting to go to my first actual concerts, you know? My mom took me in. Do you remember my, your first concert? My very first concert was Alice Cooper. Yeah, I mean, like big concert, you know? Yeah. And my mom took me, you know, it was awesome. Yeah. Uh, but after that, you know, I was going regularly. I, I hung out with an older crowd in high school, so I always had access to a car and to get to shows and stuff. And I, you know, I've told this story before, but it's, it's the truth. The one that changed me was going to see Supertramp, right? Like I saw Supertramp on Crime of the Century in 1974, 1975, right? And I remember standing in that audience and just having this moment of, wow, what is going on here? You know, I mean, there is way more going on here than the band just on stage playing. You know, like, there was just, it was just so diametrically different than other yeah. concert experiences I had at that time. And the funny part now is I look back on it now, right? I look back on that and I go, you know, I remember, like I can, I have pictures in my mind of what the PA was and I got, I got a run through on the console. That, that's a whole nother story in itself from, uh, from Russell Pope. But I look back on that now and I go, man, that was five years removed from Woodstock, right? Five years later from Woodstock, and I had that kind of experience. I mean, now I look, you know, at the time I didn't process any of that, but I look back on that and I'm like, wow, how fast did our industry change to be able to do audio of that kind of quality, you know? So, uh, sitting, sit, talking about that back then and this now, it, it's interesting, and some, I've heard this a bit of, we've lost that ability to really use and captivate an audience as a musician, and I don't mean to jump ahead with this, but yeah. sitting where you're at now, do you feel like we've kind of lost some of those greats that, that you didn't have the LED walls, you didn't have pyro, we didn't have all this well, equipment? Well, there wasn't focus on it, you know, but I, I mean, I mean, at this point, I mean, even audio-wise, you had to be really well steeped in the fundamentals. Sure. I mean, you were gonna have to get everything out of everything you used. I yeah. Mean, there was just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I mean, my entry into the business predates digital. I remember the days where we didn't even have anything called a reverb. I mean, it was, you know, a spring reverb. You might find something <laughs> like that or some delay. You yeah. Know, you might get some delay, but, you know, it, it required focus to make that really work. But to say that, you know, we don't need all of this stuff, you know, I think I, to me that's disingenuous. You mm. know? We've all had those moments of where we want the show to be big and engaging and glorious sure. and et cetera. Uh, and, I mean, I'll just, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that concerts are better today than they've ever been. So I'm, I'm not one of these, you know, kind of throwback guys. Oh, Pure we need to go stuff. back to yeah. what we yep. used to do. No, yep. we don't. I mean, for, I mean, I have this argument, not an argument, but this discussion with guys a lot of times who go, oh, we should go back to the old PAs. They sounded better. And I'm just like, dude, man, if, if you actually believe that, you didn't mix on enough of those PAs. I heard a, uh, a statistic recently that it was saying that the $80 speakers nowadays are better than the $1,000 speakers from back 100%. 100%. I mean, driver technology today is mind-blowingly great. You know? And, I mean, we, you know, we've got so many options to us now and so many ways to manipulate audio sure. now. And, I mean, I, you know, I've done a fair amount of teaching on the subject, et cetera, and I, I can still say with good confidence, the technology has outpaced the users at this point. Like, you know, we still That's are quite catching up. It, well, it is. You know, I mean, in terms of mixing skills, managing, yeah. et cetera, it's kind of overwhelmed everybody a little bit. I mean, it was really part of my, uh, it was part of my motivation during the pandemic to kind of go online and do nothing but teaching. I was like, yeah. we, we need to see this as an opportunity. Our industry's shut down right now. Let's all smarten up and catch up. Yeah. You know, let's take this time to do that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, this is a, I mean, it's, it's fair to say this thing we got going on now, this is complex. I mean, there's a level of complexity in this that is, it's intense, you know? Yeah. So you're sitting there as a kid, amazing concert. Yeah. There's the moment, the aha moment for you. Yeah, that's when I, I mean, I knew when I left that show, I was like, that's what I want to do right there. That's. No Did you question. know specifically or just like you want to be no, involved No, no, I knew with... specifically that's like, I want to mix concerts. I want to do sound at concerts. I mean, I went to my high school. I, I think I was a sophomore at the time, freshman maybe. And I met with my guidance counselor, you know, the career counselor. I said, okay, this is what I want to do. And he was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Right now. <laughs> you know? He goes, this sounds technical. Maybe you yeah. should go in the army. I was like, no, 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 no. Time out. No, no. 
we're not going to do that. So. <laughs> so fast forward me a little bit to your first tour. First tour. Okay, so, um, you know, I got out of high school, and okay. what we decided to do was send me to a technical institute. I mean, keep in mind, there were no recording schools, no... Sure. And no schools well, that? at that point. 78. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I mean, it was nothing, yeah. you know? So, you know, we both kind of felt like, well, this looks like engineering, you know, let's at least get you a technical background, et cetera. So I went to school at a Missouri Institute of Technology outside of Kansas City. I'm studying toward a double E. Oh, MIT, you know? cool. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah, it's nice to call it that. It sounds better. Yeah, right? MIT. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, after not too long of being there, I started to realize, okay, this isn't getting me where I want to go. You know, it's, this is not going to get me in the music business or the concert production business. This is going to get me a job at Bell Labs or Honeywell or sure. something like that, which I didn't want to do. Which is funny because most people would want to go that route, whereas you're like, well, I'll, t I'll, tell you what, uh, this, I'll tell you this little side story because this is kind of what set the hook in me. So I was probably about, I'm going to guess I was about a month away from my associate's degree. I mean, I was about two thirds of the way through the program. And I, I had kind of taken a job kind of working with a, a local regional sound company. You know, that was kind of my, and once I got in there, I was like, okay, yeah, this is what I need to be doing. That's not what you're going to be doing. But I got out on a, on, I went out on a show where the engineer on the show got sick and I had, they asked me to fill in for him for about three weeks, right? And his pay, everything. I, I remember coming back from that as a 19 year old, uh -huh. you know, with this bunny. And it was right about recruitment time at the school because we were close to ending a segment. And I was watching all these guys get recruited by Bell and Honeywell and McDonnell Douglas, all these people. And I'm looking at the packages they're giving them and I'm looking at the money I got. I'm thinking, dude, you guys are going in the wrong business, man. I was like, I'm going to do this, you know? So that, that was, it was like, well, if I can make more money doing this, of sure. course I'm going to do this. Yeah. So, you know, so that, that was kind of the moment that really did it. And then, you know, kind of happenstance, living in Kansas City at that time, there was a band that had just signed out of their uh, band called Shooting Star. And they had signed a big record deal with Virgin, went over to London, recorded their first record with Gus Dudgeon. I mean, it was, it was awesome. And it was an awesome first record. Absolutely stellar first record. And, you know, I ended up in the studio with them a couple times, just doing little odds and ends work and got to meet them and got close with them. And when they got ready to go out on tour, they asked me to go out on tour with them. So I went out as a monitor mixer and a drum roadie and a few other things, you know, but that was by the end of that year, I mean, we had, we had been opening for everybody. I mean, ZZ Top, Jefferson Starship, all of these people. So I made all these connections with it. it was smart enough to have a Rolodex at that time going, yeah, okay, I got it. And that was kind of my first real, real foot in the door. Because you've done both sides. You've done studio and also live. I have, yeah, yeah. I did a lot of studio work in the 80s. Um, I had, a, I mean, I had my own studio and my own record label in the 90s. I was trying to kind of build my own empire kind of thing. You know? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it was at a time... I mean, where the music industry was really changing and it was kind of upside down a little bit, you know, and I mean, this is going to sound terrible to say this because I worked for Digidesign and Avid for a period of years, but, you know, Pro Tools was coming to prominence at that point sure. in terms of recording and this sure. whole idea of individualized recording and remote recording and all these kind of things. Yeah. And it really just didn't sit with me. I just, I mean, even the records that I was producing at the time, I was really focused on ensemble recording. It's like, mm. okay. There still has to be a unit recording here. We can't just record these things one at a time. And I, there's like, I, didn't, I just didn't believe in that kind of thing. You know? yeah. I mean, the Pro Tools is an incredible power in your hands. But man, you got to make the right decisions with it about the music. You yeah. know? I mean, if you're going to use it as a recorder, great. If, I mean, there, you just have to have real discipline with it. And I just found myself just going, I'm just going to go back to live work. I, I don't. I, everybody was demanding we work in Pro Tools. I was just saying, I'm not going to do this. Well, looking back now, that what a great decision to be able to do that. Because look at what uh, a lot of the studios have gone to nowadays. Right. I right. mean, it's mainly, I mean, you look at Billie Eilish's albums yeah. and on a laptop. Right. I mean, my goodness, I know a ton of studios, especially even in this area, that have just... Yeah, well, well what are you going to do, you know? Yeah. You do? I, mean, I mean, that's the interesting part of it. I mean, the not to go down this rabbit hole, sure. but it's kind of what the music industry has become, right? And I, I, this is a very unpopular opinion to have, but the music industry and the artists of the music industry kind of got what they asked for, hmm. right? They wanted democratized music, yeah. want to produce my own music, yeah. they want it to be record quality, I don't want there to be any gating between me getting in a big studio, I want to be able to publish my own music, I want to be able to get the first money 
Well, you have all of that, yep. but the mechanism yeah. to deliver all that is completely broken. And how do you stand out in the noise now? Well, that too, right? Yeah. I mean, we, I've always had this argument about Spotify, you know, making Spotify the, and maybe we'll just call streaming the, the villain here, right? Sure. It's like, well, yes, okay, you don't have a revenue stream for your product now. And part of it is because we can't define what Spotify is, hmm. right? Is it my record collection? Well, if it's my record collection, when I go home, every time I put something on and play it, I don't pay the artist. Yeah, yeah. Is it a radio station? Well, if it's a radio station, then every time they play it, the artist should get paid. Yeah. Is it record distribution? If it's distribution, then they should get paid. Like we've stripped out the revenue mechanism and all to the, all to the benefit of the record labels right now. You know? So going through that process and seeing that, knowing what you know now, what do you think is the future in terms of, of that? <sighs> Man, hard to say. I mean, we're kind of seeing the future here where, sure. I mean, the emphasis for artists right now, their only real, real path to revenue is in licensing or in doing shows, sure. in doing live shows. You yeah. know? I mean, that's a huge revenue stream for people now. You know? It's been interesting, especially with the age of TikTok now. And I mean, I know we're going down this rabbit trail, but um, that I know of artists that will release hooks and if the hook does well, they'll write the they'll rest write the of the song, song yeah. for it, which is just, as a musician, it grinds all my gears because that's not what we well, did. I, me and Petty used to talk about this. Like we, we, all, we had some killer conversations about I'm this. I'm sure. And he was talking about, and I think you could say this a lot of, about a lot of bands of his era, that if they would have come in at this point, they, they wouldn't have made it. You know? mm. And he said, because the, the whole process, the whole growth process is upside down right now. And when he was coming up, you had to prove yourself through performance and writing, et cetera, in order to be gated into the recording studio to record a product. And then it might get released. Today, the first thing you do is record the record, right? I mean, that's how you can end up with somebody at yeah. Coachella yep. who's never been on stage before, right? I mean, it's upside down. I remember uh, my dad had a recording studio and I, I remember just watching albums come out and I remember they had uh, index cards laying out of the <laughs> songs and the keys of them because you, you're thinking about the listener's experience from the beginning of the album to the end of the album. Oh, yeah, so the how whole. do you want that entire flow to go? And then how do you translate in that into live for Sequencing it? Sequencing the just, records is done. I mean, we, it's just that we've got exist. sound bites yeah. now yeah. for it. But sorry, I got off on a, on a tangent with that, but it's been, it's, um, it is interesting to think about and to see where we're at now and then what is the future in terms of live music as well. I mean, you've yeah. seen so many different changes from when you've started, I'm sure from when you stood there as a kid, seeing well, that to I mean, now. Even just being on this tour was really a little bit of a revelation for me because I mean, I've, I've grown up in a time where, I mean, I remember a period of time where if you were doing a stadium show, I mean, you were part of a big festival. There was nobody headlining stadiums, mm. you know? Now everybody's headlining stadiums. It's like that's how much it has grown, you yeah. know. I mean, I was, you know, kidding Kenny about it one day on when we finished up the last tour because we, he always finishes his stadium run in Foxborough, you know, where the where the Patriots play, and they have a big dedication wall to him up there, and I was looking at it this tour and I was thinking, my gosh, man, we're gonna go back there. We're gonna go to three sold out nights there, this coming year. That's going to be his 26th, 27th, and 28th time selling out that stadium. I was like, you are kidding me, right? And it's like that everywhere we go with this. I, I, even when I came to work for him, I didn't realize how big the whole, you know, No Shoes Nation thing was. Yeah. It was really startling. I, I just couldn't get over it. Um, I know there's a lot of engineers, especially nowadays, that have only done live. Yeah. You going from studio to live, do you feel like a lot of that helped you in the live sound translated over? Do you see it as kind of separate? Because I mean, there's two different things of like, one is you can create in a uh, in an environment that's controlled. And I yeah. mean, you read about, let's talk about the Beatles, you read about like, make it sound more orange, or make <laughs> it sound more whatever. Well, here's, here's what happens. And I've been on record as saying this a long time. If you want to be a mixer, then you've got to get in somewhere where you can learn how to mix. And that's in the studio because you hear in high resolution there, right? You're hearing something consistent day to day. You're gonna learn- Overdoing the clubs, you think? Way overdoing, oh, for sure overdoing clubs. Get me in a studio, get me some tracks and learn how to mix and make it work in that environment. If you can't make it work out of this speaker, there's no way you're gonna make it work out of that. I've watched more, and it goes both ways. I'll just tell you this right now. I've watched 
live guys go in the studio and fall flat on their face. Sure. I've watched studio guys come out here and fall flat on their face, you know. What do you think is the missing link there? Well, for the studio guy, this is the constant, right? Huh. Everything is judged through that, right? If, if something doesn't sound right, it's not the speaker's fault, it's something here. Well, out here, that's the variable, right? Interesting. The room, the PA, yeah. everything. So you have to be really disciplined about going, no, that sounds like it's supposed to sound and it's not translating there, right? Yeah. And typically studio guys don't have that skill of optimizing a PA system in a space to make it translate a mix, right? Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, I have a lot of new engineers that watch this, and obviously seasoned ones. And I usually ask this towards the end, but I, since we're here, I'd love to. Uh, what, do you, what advice would you have for the brand new ones that like, would love to be where you're at, and they have no, no experience whatsoever? This well, just like, as I've told, uh, I've told this to so many people, and advised so many people on this, and I stand by it. Mixing is a listening skill. It is not an operational skill. I can teach, I can teach a 12-year-old how to operate the console. What I can't teach them is to have music sensibilities, right? Why do I need this kind of drum sound in this kind of song? Why do I need this kind of guitar sound here? You know, what, what is a guitar forward blend versus, you know, all of these kind of things. And that programming is built listening to music, constantly, constantly listening to music and let yourself be programmed. I mean, I've, I've used this example and I, I, I do it, I, I, don't, I don't even know if I realized how important it was to me when I do it. But at home, I have music on 24 hours a day. I mean, it's just a huge library of music that is on random. And so it may go from symphony to jazz to bluegrass, whatever. But, you know, as a mixer, you start building sensibility with that. You go, oh, wow, listen to that blend there. Or, you know, listen to the position of those instruments in that music versus this other music, you know? Because yeah. you have to do that. Yeah. Uh, the most profound moment is when you're teaching somebody brand new, right? brand new, and they walk up and they hear their first input, right? Audio come in and they push up the fader, because now the question is, well, now what do I do, right? And you have to, you have, what you have to teach is the ability to work with intent. You can't push that fader up and kind of go, well, that kind of sounds cool. Okay, that's kind of cool. Yeah. No, you have, the picture has to be painted already, and you just need to execute toward it, right? You have to you have to know you have to know what the mix is going to sound like before you start building it, right? So how do you how do you explain to, to new people in terms of like I want to make one input sound good, and then have an entire band with that, not have everything step all over? Yeah, and have well that's that's the skill, right? How do I how do I know what context to put this single yes, input in? Yes, yes. Right? I mean I can make a single input sound unbelievable and not have it work at all in yep. the mix, you know, and that's you know. This kind of skill in the live world, for sure, you have to be able to kind of relay that to people on stage as well, because they're kind of in their own lanes up there. Mm. Where, okay, I got to get a great guitar sound. It's yeah. like, well, that's a great guitar sound, but I got two other guitar players up there. Can we, how are we going to make this work, right? I mean, these guys are incredible at it. I mean, three heavyweight guitar players up there, but they all know their place. They all know their, you know, their voicings, everything. It just blends into this beautiful thing up there, you know? So where we're at in our progression to getting ready for your first uh, show. Yeah. Um, you've done, you were at Soundcheck, had bands, there's your band in there for that, and now you're getting into more of a putting all the pieces together for yeah. it. Um, are you using and doing virtual sound check? No, sorry, are you recording stems from this and are you gonna use this for your uh, shows and be able to virtual sound check with what's here or you take it from out? I record every day. Okay. Anytime they're on stage, I am recording multi-track. Okay. Right? So it's 128 track records. Uh, I use it for virtual sound check every day. My, all final assessments of PA tuning, everything are done with the band playing through, I mean, pre-recorded band playing through the PA system. I don't use any kind of CDs, MP3s, anything other than maybe just getting bass settings on the PA. All final assessment is done mixing the show to the PA. So typically this is where I go into um, console and choice of console, but this is very special because you have a very special connection with this. And I usually ask, why did you get to this point with this? But you've been very connected with Avid and even the development of this, correct? Yeah, that's true, yeah. I, I mean, I was in on the very first conception meeting for it in 1999, 2000, whatever. And, you know, I kind of worked loosely with it for about the first 
three or four years of development. I mean, they had me come in kind of as a, I, I guess you'd call it a super consultant or something like that, you know, kind of guiding or yeah. vetting the th things they were doing. And then in 2005, they asked me to go to work for the company. And at the time, you know, it was interesting. I was, I was thinking about pulling back from the road a little bit. I mean, by that time, I had already been touring a long time. And I was having family. I thought, yeah, this will be good. I can pull back from the road, just do this. And of course, in no time, they wanted me to go out and use the console in the field. So I did more touring while I was working for them than I ever, ever imagined. But it, it was an awesome experience. And um, I mean, I really believed in the product for sure. I, it was, when it came out, it, it did some things that no other live sound console would do for sure. And this is a very, very exaggerated version of what we started out with for sure. Yeah, this is a little bit bigger than the regular S6Ls. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, this is a 48 fader one, which they, they make. Yeah. And I, I just got to a point, I, you know, I, I mean, I understood the appetite for it where we can do these smaller and smaller and smaller packages, but it was like, fellas, I, I stopped mixing on 32 faders in 1989, okay? I need more faders up. I, I actually touch them and mix the show with these, okay? So I said, they make the 48, please just get me the 48, yeah. you know? So, uh, Claire Brothers was gracious, gracious enough to buy me a 48, and I've had it out on all kinds of shows, including this one. So, all right. But I love it. I love it. For this act, how many inputs are we doing? Actual band inputs. Let's have a look. I mean, it's a full 128 track record. Let's see here. So, 29, so you, 30, about 90, 90 band inputs. How many, the, a lot of redundant? Uh, not necessarily redundant, but I mean, there's a lot of guest vocals, there's sure. triggers, there's talkbacks, all kinds of things. Triggers like for drums? Yeah, well, triggers for the gates on the drums. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, we, we do a lot of audience record. We have 6, 10, 12 audience mics plus a 5.1 mic at the center of the stadium. So. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because it's important. I mean, you, I mean, you gotta have a lot of mics to really capture a stadium audience and make it I mean, believable. You know? yeah, ab absolutely. And they sound great. I mean, it just sounds great when they come off. There is a lot of equipment here, um, but there's not very much outboard. You have some outboard. Can you walk me through what you do have here? I see some 500 stuff. I see a two-tap, two, yeah, two tech. Yeah, this is really, 5045. I mean, this is right across my mix bus. I, I use that kind of as a, mastering style, multi-band limiter. Uh, but this stuff is all vocals, right? This is just Kenny's vocal, some guest vocals, backing vocals. And that's really it for inserts, uh, analog inserts. Uh, I got a DBX 120A that I use on the drums and bass. I got, you know, this is kind of unique, this tour, I finally got this all put together. That's a set of, um, on the left is a set of Telefunken transformers, and on the right is a set of Western Electric transformers really and I use them as channel inserts right like the, there's a huh. pair of transformers right across the mix bus one right across Kenny's vocal and the telefunkens right now are across the backing vocals so they work it's just fantastic that's awesome yeah yeah they work great uh, UAD waves I have both out here now I have the, okay. a real-time rack but I'm not I got a couple of reverbs slated in it right now but that I'm not using okay uh, the waves, I'm really only using the metering in it right now. I use their Luffs metering and some of their Duro stuff. Okay. But no, no processing at this point. Um, all the other processing is done on board with the plug-in stuff. So. Okay. Everything's done here. Oh, wow. Can you show some of the uh, plugins you're using? Yeah, sure. So, um, I, you know, it's really kind of... All of my plug-in use really kind of plays very close to what I do in the studio. I mean, it's the same sort of thing. Like, you know, across my mix bus, obviously I got the transformers and the, uh, the multiband, but I also have a Pultec EQ and then some tape saturation, you know, like trying to emulate half inch, yeah. right? And same thing for the groups, like a lot of my, I use audio subgroups, so drums, bass, guitars, all of those will have some sort of tape sat included with them. Uh, and all the way down to the input side, like if I go to input drums, so some of the inputs like kicks, snares, those will have Pultex on them for specific use. So I, I really rely on broadband shaping really for the most part, so. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty, it's actually pretty simple. Now what I do do on the drums, for instance, uh, let me get back here, 
is I do malted drums. Like, so I'll have, and I usually have this combined into one set of parallel compression for rock stuff. But on country, I felt the need to separate out the bass drum from the snare drum, bass drum and toms from the snare drum. Because typically on country records, the, the kick and the toms are very dry compared yeah. to the snare, right? So I had yeah. to kind of redo it a little bit. So was, there's a primary comp of the kick mics and then a parallel compressed version of it and then a malted version of it that's distorted. And like it has a sans amp on it and that's where I get all the attack on the bass drum is from that. Similar sort of thing on the snare where, you know, there's a regular snare routing and then there's a, a compressed and EQ'd set of snare comp mics. And again, a, a pretty distorted, tape saturated, really hanky sounding thing when you hear it, but you blend it in with the drum and you go, oh, okay, all right, that is huge. So there are places like, depending on song, sometimes I'll put pitch change on this. Really? Like to, to get it to be fat wide, you know? Sometimes it's reverb, sometimes there's echo on it, whatever, just depending on the snare moment that is needed, right? Pitch change in the snare drum, that's fantastic. Yeah, oh, it's fantastic. And then, you know, on all, almost all my stuff, I have some version of drum room and drum plate. So, and just depending on the song, tempo, space needed, sometimes I'll feature more room and a wide open plate, more of a clear plate. Yeah. Or sometimes I'll do less room and a dense plate. You know, just again, depending on the snare production that I'm trying to do for a given song, so. So specifically for country, what is your trick to getting a good sounding kick drum? Well, the, I mean, the kick, the, the, the trick to getting any good sounding kick drum is to have a good sounding kick drum. <laughs> I mean, I hate to be that way. Uh, but, you know, when I, I, I'll say this to you, when I showed up at this camp, they were already using uh, some of the SE mics, right? Uh, SE kick. Yep. Uh, they didn't have the SE plate mic at that point and SE toms and stuff. And I, I'll just be deadly truthful with you. I was very skeptical when I walked in. I just thought, okay, come on, really now? Seriously? Same thing on Kenny's mic. It was a SE V7, you know, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll be fair with it. Man, I'm, this is no exaggeration. I came in, I turned those inputs on, and I pushed that vocal up, and I was like, oh my gosh, right now. Hmm. Like, why would anyone mess with that? It was just like, I just had to back off of completely go, I'm not touching that, sorry. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it was just fantastic. So, and he's a cupper, you know what I mean? He's yeah. all over the mic. Yep. And Phil uh, Robinson, the monitor guy, he and I have done a lot of A-B testing. We even tested some new mics that came in the other day. It was like, okay, let's make sure we still believe that yeah. this is the thing. And as soon as you did this to it, they just went completely to crap. You know? Got it. So this is an amazing thing, amazing okay. thing. Um, is this the normal setup you have on the road, all mm -hmm. this? Yeah. Okay, can you walk us through I, all the screens here as well? Yeah, this is new this year. I kind of, um, I mean, if people go on Facebook, my Facebook page, you'll see the build of this. You know, I will show them how to do it. Because I took an old office monitor bar hmm. and kind of hybrided some LP claws into a ram latch here or a ram ball here. And it just worked out great. It rides in the back of the doghouse. So it works really cool. So Alcon Nearfields, absolutely my favorite thing I've ever mixed on to set this stuff up. They are unbelievable. Uh, ribbon, top end, ultra powerful. I'll let you hear a little bit of it okay. in a little bit. Uh, these are just USB SMPTE readers for the Pro Tools machines, okay. and I use them strictly for confidence so that I can be in this field and tell that it's still in record and still going. Because sure. the Pro Tools machine is a little bit farther away from me on the day. Uh, this is all metering from waves. So like I said, Duro is right across the mix bus. This is on my wet mix, which we do, sometimes we'll stream that. So I, hmm. I'm cognizant of luff syllables there. Sure. And then I have a mastered version of that as well okay. here that I'm looking at. Just to kind of see, you know, just see the two different versions of it. And we kind of pick which ones we want to use. Uh, events, this is all built into the console. This is one of the features of the consoles where you, uh, console where you can basically do all kinds of operation here if you want to do it. Uh, so it's two pages of that. Like I can go to, you know, big group meters big matrix meters and clear it out. Uh, AFL, PFL, top of channel, prefade, all the different signal choices. I can yeah. change the metering out. I can go to virtual sound check from here if I want to do it. Can sc scroll through all the safe options on it from here without having to dig into the software to do yeah. it. You know, I can just do it very quickly here for the show. I can navigate the all of the screens from here. So. Uh, this is 
a smart computer that I actually built for this tour, uh, another one of these little build things. But I have it, like I took a, a Sonnet chassis for a Mac Mini mm -hmm. and modified it to hold a Focusrite interface on the right side of it. So this is the smart that I use to uh, do all the latency measurements on the console if I need it. And then for the show, I have Mix up there and Solo Bus. So anything I solo will show up there, anything, and I can look at it against Mix Bus. This is an extra monitor from my SE's thing, so I can actually oh. look at the, uh, the FFT uh, yeah. that he's generated. I can see SPL. Uh, if I want to do it, I can zoom in on a piece of it, and he sees it and goes, oh, that part you're going for? <laughs> yes. Uh, and then on top of it, I can just switch it over to uh, SDI, and now I've got Kenny's ISO there if I want to do it. You know, so. It's just great having it all right in the field of vision, you know. Well, uh, a dock as well. A dock as well. Yeah, let's, uh, maybe I'll do this just to get some meter going here and you guys can see what's going on here. Yeah, so uh, the dock I use, again, primarily because the Pro Tools is not near me. Uh, so when I'm in virtual sound check, what this allows me to do is actually set loops very quickly. Okay. Like if I just and want to work on a section, I just create an in, create an out, and it'll loop right there and I can do it. Um, the app that you see there is a new app. It's a guy that, uh, a guy named Bob Brown. Bob Brown, have I got that right? Ooh, I hope I do. Uh, who, former guy that worked at uh, Avid with me, right? Okay. And he called me up about this, but it's a meters plugin, a remote meters plugin. So it works on network like that. I just have a LAN network set up for all this. And you can look at anything that's on the LAN. Well, right now I have, that's one machine, but I could have two 128 track machines metering here if I want to do it. And you can set threshold for alerts. Like if you say, okay, anything above minus six, it'll tell me what track it is, right? So it's actually way better than actually seeing the machine. It's just killer, you know? Looks really, really good. And then you have a venue sitting over here. Yeah, that's C24, so, um, or 24C. So we have that, I, I talked the production into doing this in the earliest days of it, because it was like, okay, look, we're living in a time now where we cannot have stadium audiences without any audio, okay? Mm. No console in the world never crashes. We need to have the best response to a crash, all right? And the Avid kind of ecosystem so makes this really easy. It is, yeah, it's working on input sharing and gain tracking, so identical show files on each, Okay. right? This is chasing my snapshots over here, so as I load, or recall a snapshot It'll here, I'll recall it there. Over. And then the system engineer just decides which console is online, right? Have you had to... Uh... Not yet, not yet. I mean, it's like buying insurance, right? If you got insurance, you never have an accident, we hope. Right? <laughs> but the other piece of that is this world, right? Like in previous tours, we've had to duplicate the insert rack for yeah. that console, yeah, yeah. right? Well, we've changed that with Maddie now. So we're doing A to D conversion here and turning this entirely into Maddie stream. And it goes to uh, Diotech Prodigy and then Prodigy can, with snapshot recall, can say, okay, well, the sends are coming from this console or this console, hmm. right? Snapshot recall, we're on backup now. Yeah. Now all the sends are being, the returns are going to both consoles at all times, but the sends change over, so you can only, only need one, one rack of gear, right? Other addition this year is an H9000, which I've been really, really happy with. It's a really cool unit. Here, I'll show you how committed I am to it here. <laughs> Let's take the plastic off. Uh-oh, he's You're taking the plastic off. All right, there's no Ooh. turning back now. <laughs> yeah, I've, been, I've worked with it for a couple of months before I really decided to do it, but once I got, a, got around their user interface and really started digging in on some of their presets, it was really, really good. So I got, basically what it turns it into is four complete, four discrete stereo processors. And I use it for vocals, backing vocals, and some uh, some very specific drum stuff. So, in the show. So, I, I am sure that everybody who follows you on social media or Facebook knows that you are a mad scientist. <laughs> and one of the things I really want to see, and I hope it's here, is your newest creation. Oh, you mean the bass rig? Yes. yes. Is it here? Yeah. Can we see yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course we can see it. Yeah, well, let me tell you where that comes from. Okay, please right? do. I mean, it certainly comes from my father, for sure. I mean, he was kind of a guy who just said, look, if you want things the way you want them, you're probably going to have to build them. You know, and he, he was one of those kind of guys if he would do it. But, you know, when I was in high school, you know, Boston's first record came out, and the whole story of Tom Scholl's 
kind of became a narrative, you know. And that resonated with me. There was something about that guy, you know, I mean, his MIT photographic engineer, blah, 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 but also a musician, kind of renaissance man designing yeah. his own gear. There was something about that I thought, yeah, that'd be cool to be that guy, you know. And now so, you're that guy. Yeah, I'm not him, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a similar, similar narrative, you know. Yeah, I would love to see if, if we can see some of the, like, the mic set up. Of and, course, of course. Um, Let's go up there. Come on. For the, uh, the tour, I'm assuming your stage is going to be about this big every single time. This is the actual stage size, including the ramp. Uh, so that goes out in front of the PA. Is you actually, the thrust is going to actually go out this way too? Oh, yeah. Woo! Yeah, yeah he's out in front of it for Woo. probably 60, 70% of the show. So. Woo! Yeah. It'll get your attention. Yeah. That's for sure. Uh, are you guys doing, it looks like one wedge, mainly ears? Everybody's on ears. Okay. Full ears all the time. There's no live audio on stage other than the drum kit. Wow. The only, thing, the only reason that wedge is there is that Danny Rader plays on Fractal. So that's his only way of actually hearing any audio. I mean, it's just always coming there and it's not very loud, it's just for reference. So. Okay. So uh, Danny Rader, okay. John Conley, and Kenny Greenberg. Um, this is all their amp world. So these hey, guys I are all on- I see some 58s up here. Those are all talkbacks. <laughs> <laughs> those are all communication mics. So these are the amp rigs. This is uh, John Conley's new rig. This is an incredible piece of engineering here, third power. It's like, what amp do you want? AC30, Blackface, I mean, it oh, just geez. does it all. And any combination, it's fantastic. Kenny's on Marshall and Electro Harmonics. These guys just released this version of the MiG-50, which is fantastic. I just sold my MiG-50. <laughs> now they're gonna make another one. And do these live on stage? or these just live right, right where they are. Okay, yeah. wow. Everything is where it will be for the tour. Okay. So we have a live uh, B3 and plays, you know, pianos through Nord, et cetera. I mean, the change here this year is I've gone to a combination of XY mic and I call it a Z mic, right? So, uh, and I've got it set up on the console where I can chase this a little bit. So if he's playing pads on the organ, then it's the wide mics, right? And split out left and right. But if he's doing anything choppy or hmm. featured, I have it set up on fader where past a certain level on my VCA, these turn on and that turns off and it's more mono compatible. It's more centered on the organ sound. So works out really good. Terry, the bass tech guy built these little things for it. He's another craftsman, <laughs> built these holders for it. Works out great. You nerds. Yeah, total nerds. <laughs> so we get Byron M160s there, all ribbon up on that. And it's been sounding really, really good. Uh, Harmony, the bass player, that's, that was the focus of the whole thing back here. I don't know if you oh, have yes, enough light yes, back yes, here. Yes, yes, yes. So. He made this entire thing in case you guys didn't know. <laughs> this Let me is... see if I can get some light back there. Right, so obviously it's turned off right now, but um, the idea is you have this Ampeg amp. It's a 15 inch speaker and a ah, tweeter. Ah. There. ah, thank you, Phil. Uh, and the goal of this, I, I've been kind of thinking about this build for a long, long time. Did you like, ma just guys to understand, he made this entire... Yeah, well, I made this piece of it, right? Terry, the bass tech, had the cart made, and he had the amp ready for me. What uh, is, before you jump into it, what inspired it? Well, uh, you know, it... Was I, it I, MIT, I, was it? No, no it wasn't <laughs> MIT. Again, this kind of gets back to the studio thing versus the live yeah. thing, right? Because... You know, I did so many sessions where, you know, just the kind of the de facto mic that I used on bass cabinets in the studio was a FET 47, mm. a Neumann FET 47. And, you know, again, I'm kind of on a little bit of a crusade with this where, you know, out, like we get out here and we get sucked into convenience, you know, everyone wants to use the DI. And, you know, I, even with Harmony, you know, when we first started this out, I mean, she was just on the DIs. And I was like, well, gosh, man, you're trying to hang with three guitar players up here. I mean, your, your sound needs some juice, you know? Mm. So I was doing amp emulations out at the front of the house. I was doing an SVT simulation on a Sans amp out there. And it, and it was good. I mean, it was, it was workable. But I, always in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, okay, we gotta find a way to get the right amp out here and get the right amp sound and get her to be able to hang. Cause she's a huge personality on stage. Like visually, she is in it up there and you know, I wanted to be able to hang with three distorted guitars. And you know, you're, not gonna, you're just not gonna do it with just a sterile 
base DI. It's just not going to hang there harmonically, you know? So I, I kind of went to her and I said, okay, you, <laughs> we kind of posted this online the other day. I was like, do you trust me? <laughs> so, you know, I kind of took on this project, I, but I'd been thinking about this for a long time. Matter of fact, if you can see this, this was kind of the 1.0 oh, version wow. of it. As this is on the guitars. I don't know if you can get around here on it. We need a flashlight, don't we? At any rate, if you can get up in the top and see here, there's three microphones down in here, right? So no two microphones are ever on. It's uh, only one mic is on at a time. But this is a, just a little half moon cavity that I built for it so that there wouldn't be any real standing waves in it. And the idea here is I, uh, microphone isolation. It's not to make this quieter or keep it quiet. It's to keep the environment that these mics are in very stable, right? So the idea is the 57 is his primary rhythm sound. And then if he goes as for distorted and mid distorted, if he goes really clean, like really shiny clean, then I go to SM59, which is a really flat mic, but doesn't have the pop up in the top like the 57. And then there's an AEA ribbon here that I use for the solos, right? So it's KU5A. So it, it's all kind of set up where if he's soloing, it's that mic. If he's clean, it's that mic. If it's distorted, it's that mic. And I do the same thing for John Connolly, the other player. But this was kind of the 1.0 version of this. So this actually has uh, four tube trap, half round traps in it that are mid bass absorptive and high frequency diffusive, right? And again, the idea is to keep the microphone isolated, give it a really, really clean environment and stable, predictable environment. And then bring them into two SVT mic pre's. Her pedal, which is the front end for this amplifier, we take a DI of that for the guys in post. So when it goes to post, they have DI right off the guitar, they have the post pedal DI, and then they have the two mics, you know, separate. And I, I had another engineer uh, suggest this to me when I, I started talking about doing this online one day or something, and he was like, dude, the secret sauce there is you need to get an SM59. So SM59 in time and blended up with that FET 47, it's like diction and warmth, you know, you just get this beautiful combination of it. And I had, I, I don't even know if I even had heard of an SM59, you know? I was like, SM59, what the hell is that, you know? Started looking it up, I even found some of the old ads for 59 versus 58, because they all came out at the same time. And you look at the top end on the 59 and it's almost ruler flat, you know, like there's no high frequency, high frequency exaggeration in it, very, very tailored bottom end. I started, I was thinking, okay, I, I know how this is gonna work now. And sure enough, I mean, the first day in rehearsals, I pushed up those two mics. I was like, are you kidding me right now? Are you kidding me right now, you know? I really wanna hear this. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow, man. I mean, it was just so good. And of course, I've got her listening to it in the ears now. So, so cause it's gonna, she's gonna have to adjust to it a little bit because sure, sure. it's like, if she gets really aggressive, it can get a little clacky on the on the bass, so she's learning to play to it, and she's come a long way with it, you know, so it's been really, really good. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. This is awesome. This is awesome. So we set it up, you know, to give it access and stuff like you can, like this is all on this sli um, slider, so you just take off these three knobs, three, these three knobs, and this comes off, and if you want to take the whole lid off, you just take off these, and then the whole lid sits back, and you can get to the microphones, et cetera. So. That's incredible. Yeah, it's good. So this is uh, the kit for Nick Buta. He is a Noble and Cooley endorser. So that whole concept of having a really good drum to start with, yeah, that works out really, really good here. Uh, he's a great player. Melvis, the guy, his drum guy, just is fantastic at tuning. Like it's just, I just never even give it a thought now. He's just so good at it. So we got SEs on the toms, SEs in the bass drum. Uh, I have one of the Solomon sub kicks on the front. Okay. Uh, 57 on the snare plus the new Loughton snare mic, which I'm actually just, I'm really kind of leaning on the Loughton just to give some weight to the drum. Like there are times when the, when it sounds more like a normal snare and if I add in the Loughton, then it gets really big and you know, like that really fat kind of country thing. Yeah. I can do that really easily with that. Then he'll change out all kinds of snares in that second snare. There's fatty bright, really, really bright, you know, all kinds of stuff. There's distortion going on out the front for that. And you got three overheads. I do, yeah. So the idea here is, you know, I do a stereo pair and then a stereo ribbon right over the top that is primarily focused on the snare drum. Like it's actually gated and tr that gate is triggered by the snare drum. 
So it's just like a room mic on snare. So how many mics do you have on the snare drum? Well, the two close mics, yep. uh, a bottom mic, which yep. is Telefunken, I think it's the cut down version of the M80, and then the overheads, right? So. But that, the distance on that works really good. So what I, I, I've actually got it, I, I think I might have done some video on this. I've got a snare drum of my own that has a speaker and a smart interface built into it, right? So you set the speaker in there and turn the noise on, okay. and you can phase align the three microphones, right, to the snare drum. It works, I, it, you know, to my ears, I'm like, yes, that's better, okay? And you made that too? Yeah. Of course you did. <laughs> of course you did. What else did you make? Uh, you know, the, the Did you make the car the you came in on too? <laughs> So, looking back, what do you feel like is your proudest moment of your career? Woo! Wow, man, that's hard. Besides doing an interview with us, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, I mean, this is going to sound so flippin' corny, but I'm going to say it. My proudest moment is surviving. Mm -hmm. I mean, being able to be really at the top of the heap. You know, I'm working on tours of the scale since I was a kid, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I was very fortunate. I mean, I, I was really, really lucky. I got in at a pretty high level. I didn't have to grind it out in clubs or anything for years and years. I mean, we started out pretty high up the food chain, you know, so, but I think that imprints you a different way too. Like, you know, I know for me, I, I have a, I, I've just grown to believe this over time. I have a little different expectation of the result than some people have, you know? I, I mean, it has to be great. Yeah. I'm not, you know, as my friend Mr. Petty used to say, we're not here to be okay. We're here to be great. I mean, let's, let's get after it until we get it right, you know. I'm not here to just be okay. They're not expecting okay. When was the moment for you that you knew, ah, okay, I made it? Dude, I think we all suffer from sure, in, I imposter mean. <laughs> syndrome. <laughs> imposter syndrome, I don't know if you ever believe that, you know. But I'll say this, mixing on this tour, uh, this is the most enjoyable environment, both in terms of band members and mixing. And I, it may be one of the most enjoyable things I've done. I, I think probably for me, if I, if I had to answer your question honestly, when I got selected to do Rush in the late 80s through the 90s, that was, that was the brass ring for me because I was a huge fan, huge, huge fan. I, you know, I could have died and retired doing that gig, no problem. You know. It was my favorite, favorite thing I've ever done probably. It was because they were just awesome. I mean, they were just incredible to work for. I probably learned more during that period of my life than any other time. So, what do you feel like separates a good audio engineer from a great audio engineer? Uh, the ability to work with intent. Right. Expand on that a little bit. Be able to not just come in and respond to what's going on, but have a vision, an audio vision, and a direction that you want to make something go and achieve it. That's, you know. Not just, you know, the whole idea of mixing an event is not just getting the faders up to sit and there it is, okay, just play. Yeah. You have to mix the event. And the guys that can do that really well, you know, that's, I mean, I've, I've heard shows, I mean, you know, like my top five or 10 shows are all guys that I know are just incredible mixers and guys that mix with intent, you know? So I know there's a lot of people who look up to you, including me. <laughs> who do you look up to? Uh, Engineer-wise, or yeah. just in general? Uh, or both. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I look up to some of the people that were kind of my mentors, for sure, uh, growing up. I mean, I mean, I, through my time with Def Leppard, I, you know, I had the very, very fortune, a great fortune to hang out a bunch with Mike Shipley. Mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of be inside him a little bit on some of his moves, and, and I learned so much from him, you know. I don't even know if he knows or, or would know how much I gleaned from watching him work and, you know, watching his ears work. You know, it was fascinating. It was really fascinating. So certainly a hero of mine. Uh, one of my heroes just passed away here recently, Bob Heil. You know, I mean, yeah. when, we were, when we were teenage nerdy kids, we all wanted to be Bob Heil. I mean, that's just who we wanted to be. I mean, Bob Heil does hound for the who. Yeah. Who wouldn't want to be that? Yeah. I mean, you know, so... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of recording engineers, certainly, that are, are guys that I, I really look up to. Uh, Massenberg's one of them. I mean, I think he's, he has it right. Clear Mountain. I mean, I, sure. you know, I've been lucky to work with Bob a couple of times on award shows and stuff. 
been able to go up and say to him and go, okay, you understand all the things that I try to do, you programmed into me, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? I, I, I mean, I learned how to make drum sounds from the Avalon record or mm -hmm. the first Brian Adams record. That's, you know. Wow. So, yeah, a lot of stuff like that now. Um, what do you wish you knew back then, starting off your very first tour that you, that you know now? Or what, could you, what would you tell yourself? Uh, patience. Just be patient, you know. Don't let the, you know, don't ever let the moment get bigger than what you need to do, you know. And it, it's, it's hard to do, but uh, I'm, I've been pretty blessed with that. I, you know, I've had this, uh, you know, I don't get rattled too easily in these things. And I think it's just from growing up in this environment. Yeah. You know, it, that's, that's a skill that needs to be developed over time, how to keep yourself calm and thinking when things are not going right, you know. Because yeah. you can panic and, man, I'm telling you, in big environments like that, it can spiral out of control really, really fast if you're not really 100% on it. So I'd say patience. Um, you know, really, I, I mean, things that I look back on it and I, I can see so many things in the early days of this, not only just for me, but for our industry that were tripping us up, you know, mm -hmm. like with hindsight now, you know, you can look back on it and start to realize how much the physics of audio, the wave mechanics of audio was kicking our ass in the 80s. I mean, it was absolutely kicking our ass. And, you know, you, people were having trouble kind of getting their heads around it. It's like, Okay, well, we can put up more speakers than ever right now. Hmm. Why is the sound worse? You know, what's going on? Why isn't more and more right now? And it all had to do with interaction and of speaker arrays and stuff. You know, we, we had this mindset of let's build one good sounding box and put up a whole bunch of them, you yeah. know, not thinking designed arrays. And so over time, you know, that was, it was nice to see that come to fruition. That's why I, I go back and go, okay, yes, ADS-4s, I've mixed on it. It can sound fantastic, but if you want to talk about even coverage, sorry, forget about it. You know, there was a recent announcement that was made uh, by you that you are teaming up with EAW. Yeah, I actually went to work for them uh, in January of this year. What inspired that? Well, just I, I mean, I like I mean, same thing that did when I did Avid. You know, I'm, I'm going to work for Digital Design. It's very similar. I got a very similar role now with EAW. Uh, and it was an easy fit for me. I used uh, their PA systems on the last two Tom Petty tours, and I'm a very, very b big believer in that technology that they got going on. They were way, way ahead of the time releasing that, you know. And you know, I've said it before, you know, you're gonna be the first out with something like that. It's gonna be bloody going through the door. You know, you're gonna get some blood on you. Uh, but they're doing really well now. They, that company's kind of reformulated. They got new ownership, and I'd say look out for them. They're gonna be coming around. It's gonna it. be really, really, Really fun to be a part of that. So, well, I know great. we've taken up probably way too much of your time. Thank you so much. If people want to follow you and learn from you, where can they, uh, where can they follow you? Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, either one. Okay. Probably those three. And what's your uh, Instagram? Robert Scoville. Easy. Try to keep it simple. <laughs> or to a Kenny Chesney show near you. Just yes, come, yes. Come with a come stick on or out, something. <laughs> it's a party out there. It's a good time, man. It's a good show. Man, thank you so much for your time. My I pleasure. Really Thanks. appreciate you. I appreciate you coming in. Appreciate the opportunity.